Hello and welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. Two major developments have happened in Afghanistan. U.S. is allegedly demanding U.S. military bases in Afghanistan to remain there in operation and asking the Taliban to not use Afghanistan soil for attacks on the U.S. or other countries. Now, how, how true are these statements? Are talks going on directly between the Taliban and the U.S.? Let's talk to our panel of experts and hear their analysis. Let me welcome here Ms. Ile Irshad, parliamentarian of the National Assembly of Afghanistan. Welcome to Newswire. And also we have with us Mr. Adnan Kasser, a research associate at the Conference of Defense Associations Institute in Ottawa, Canada. He's visiting uh, Pakistan and so will be joining us here uh, from Rawalpindi. Let's start with you, Ms. Ile. In light of the development that is uh, coming through, how do you see these statements? Do you feel there is any weightage on the verification of or the authenticity of these statements? The peace talk, talk uh, between America and Taliban and also countries in the region uh, are the, step, the first steps of uh, the negotiation. Um, as we all know, Afghanistan's war is a proxy war. So uh, like other countries are involved in this war. So other countries have to talk and have to find out the, how can they achieve peace uh, in, in the region. So this is the first step. The second step will be um, peace talk between um, uh, Taliban and Afghan government and uh, neighbor countries and, of course, America. So uh, once that stage of talk uh, is going to be started, uh, then the role of Afghanistan and the role of demand of the Taliban and demand of Afghanistan uh, will be uh, clear. And we can, uh, we can uh, talk on this if it's in the sake of Afghanistan or not. Uh, but uh, since uh, in Afghanistan we have uh, a war for the past four decades, like uh, 40 years um, of war, so all Afghans in our government and, uh, of course, people are tired of this war. So that's why we uh, try our best to accept some even unexpected uh, uh, requests of Taliban. Uh, like uh, uh, what I mean was uh, Afghan government will be ready or Afghan counterpart will be ready to negotiate um, uh, for example, even our constitution to bring some changes in constitution. So uh, these are uh, first steps, uh, and uh, we uh, we Afghans are quite uh, optimistic, and especially um, when we hear and we see the Pakistan government um, are uh, helping us and uh, showing a good side of uh, um, uh, agreements. Uh, this is also a good news for uh, Afghans. And uh, hopefully in Pakistan, uh, army and intelligence uh, will cooperate uh, as well. Now, the foreign minister of Pakistan, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, has time and again, and especially in light of these peace talks taking place, has continuously said that the Taliban need to speak with the Afghan government. The prime minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, has also been saying the same thing for years and he's been accused of being an Taliban apologetic and now finally the world seems to agree what he was saying was right. Mr. Adnan, how do you see the Afghan Taliban and the US and other regional powers trying to get together to come to the negotiating table unfold in the current situation? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me uh, in your program. It's a, it's a delight to, to be there and assalamu alaikum to all your viewers. So, first of all, if you allow me to to, to answer the, uh, the the comments which was made by the participant, uh, Ms. Ile, uh, about uh, this Afghan insurgency as uh, being a proxy war. Unfortunately, um, she has to uh, go back in the history of uh, of this uh, uh, this insurgency which took place. It's not a proxy war. It is an indigenous movement uh, by the Taliban. Uh, 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 whatever regime or group was and uh, so it, this is an internal affair of uh, of afghanistan uh, so it's not a proxy war and uh, uh, it is very unfortunate uh, that uh, pakistan army and its intelligence agency is uh, associated uh, somehow uh, with uh, this insurgent uh, movement in afghanistan so having said that uh, you know um, <clears throat> for, 
So Pakistan has always, uh, if, if I go back uh, to uh, 2001, uh, when this uh, Enduring Freedom uh, uh, operation started, um, and um, so uh, it, it was Pakistan had always uh, had been, had been counseling that uh, since this is a political issue, it has to be sorted out politically and there is no military solution to that. Uh, wisdom has come through suffering <laughs> uh, and um, after 17 years and now it is uh, this uh, political uh, solution is being pursued um, and uh, which is which is uh, very encouraging. And uh, Pakistan has always played a very supportive and very positive role uh, in this Afghan war. We had been um, our full, full frontline state. If you recall, during the Afghan jihad against the Soviet Union, Pakistan had been a frontline state. And during this Afghan war, we also played a very crucial role. And we had been very supportive. And, you know, uh, we were designated as a major non-NATO ally in 2004. It's, 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 a, it's a very, very uh, encouraging and uh, uh, very supportive uh, for Pakistan's uh, um, actions or Pakistan's help in bringing uh, a resolution to, uh, to this Afghan uh, pr problem, this political problem. So uh, whatever we are doing, we had been doing in the past as well. So this is nothing new. <clears throat> so whatever Prime Minister Imran Khan and uh, Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi uh, have said, uh, this is a reiteration of our, 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 our fundamental stance that there is no military solution to Afghan problem. Uh, Taliban are an indigenous um, movement. They are very much part of the Afghan fabric and they need to be accommodated. So when we say it has to be an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process, so obviously we encourage that all parties could come together and resolve this issue uh, in line with their historic uh, and very, very uh, historic uh, cultural background. Okay, Ms. Ile, let me give you a chance here to that argument claims of it being an indigenous movement. The Taliban were in power until... Uh, the U.S. attacked them in 2001 and then how they put together the alliance of the current government. Now, uh, would you like to give your take on this? Yes, of course. The um, uh, Taliban movement uh, was getting strong day by day and it's because of uh, uh, our open borders with uh, all our neighbor countries. And uh, also uh, Taliban could uh, find uh, or earn so much money uh, from um, different uh, places in Afghanistan, especially in Helmand, and especially send, uh, selling uh, drugs and also um, opium and uh, everything. So they, they were getting strong. Uh, and uh, the, the other prob uh, problem in Afghanistan was since 2014, and NATO um, left Afghanistan, and we had very less amount of soldiers in Afghanistan. And um, Afghan government was not uh, very well trained, and it was uh, new uh, military forces, and our weapons were not, not that strong. But it doesn't mean that now we are getting stronger and we can have, uh, we have already uh, some uh, helicopters and our military is getting strong. But it doesn't mean, uh, as you were guessing, to solve the problem in military issue. It has to be uh, in negotiations and um, uh, positive participations of our neighbor countries and also in the region and also superpowers. So once we um, are sure that we can uh, get, uh, we can achieve peace uh, um, uh, by the help of neighbor countries and superpowers, then uh, when we see uh, the uh, po uh, positive and supportive roles of um, some neighbor countries and also superpowers, so it means that we are going on the right path. But when when there are small issue coming, for example, Taliban would say. Uh, we are not going to um, uh, stop fighting until the uh, U.S. Uh, force or, uh, forces are in Afghanistan. And the U.S. would say, we are not going to leave Afghanistan until, until we didn't defeat the terrorism. So these, uh, that kind of statements are making us worried and it's not uh, going to reach anywhere. So that, that's why when, I, uh, when we see the positive cooperation of um, um, countries, then... 
uh, according to me, that uh, Taliban being uh, being strong or getting strong doesn't mean anything, and we can achieve small steps to toward uh, peace. And we would Afghan government and Afghan counterpart would uh, request Taliban to uh, soon even join the election, parliamentary election, right. presidential election, and then they will get their rights. And then right. if the people uh, really want them, then they can be elected. So right. So what I understand you're saying is that the government continues to offer an olive branch to the Taliban to come to the negotiating table and come and set up an interim government. Right. So, Mr. Adan, let me come to you on this. Would you see... We, what we see on the headlines is, of course, one story. We're trying to interpret what's really actually happened on the ground in terms of a strategic move by the U.S., especially when they talk about withdrawing troops. Now, but we, when we look at what just uh, how the developments have taken place, just in July last year, in 2018, a NATO summit uh, basically pledged that we will continue to stay there till 2024 to train the security of Afghan security forces. You see uh, uh, beyond what this statement uh, uh, is saying. Uh, well, first of all, you know, um, allow me to say that uh, the mindset of of uh, coalition troops, uh, the NATO forces in um, in Afghanistan, had been pretty confusing right from the onset. Uh, since this uh, this war started in Afghanistan, um, allow me to to uh, refer you back uh, to when this war actually started in October 2001. Uh, so there had been three or four major periods uh, of the war. So in December, uh, from uh, uh, from October, obviously uh, in 2001 to 2004, this was the first period when Taliban were pretty uh, pretty much crushed. Uh, 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 militarily, and they were de-seated from their uh, their their seat in, in Kabul. Uh, and then in 2003, 2004, if you if you recall, uh, the U.S. Uh, shifted its focus uh, towards the Iraq Iraq war, uh, uh, and obviously, you know, uh, it, it lost its focus from Afghanistan. <clears throat> so at that time, uh, Taliban regrouped. Uh, this was a period between 2005 2009 in 2009 again if you recall um, there had been an uh, a surge of troops and then with a with a with a timeline given that the nato forces would be withdrawn uh, from uh, afghanistan uh, starting from 2011 2012 so uh, you know this uh, statement when which was all that you know uh, uh, you might be having the watches uh, but Taliban have all the time at, yes. the, uh, at, at, at their uh, end so uh, this this is this is uh, this is one point so this strategic move um, you know Winston Churchill had said uh, something like that that uh, uh, Americans can be expected to do the right thing <laughs> after having ex expended all other uh, viable uh, options mm -hmm. so this is uh, uh, this is pretty uh, unfortunate that they, they took about 17 years to come to this conclusion that this is an unwinnable war uh, there had been books written on it uh, scholarships after scholarships have been saying uh, that there is no military solution to that uh, taliban are part of the afghan fabric 60% uh, of afghan population is uh, pashtun and uh, obviously, uh, you cannot eliminate Taliban uh, or Pashtuns uh, from the Afghan society. Mm -hmm. So now this has been drawn uh, on the international forces as well. So if you recall, in 2000, in August 2017, uh, President uh, Trump came out with a very, very hard-hitting statements against Pakistan, uh, that Pakistan is supporting, uh, allegedly supporting Taliban, uh, and uh, obviously there had been some threats of cross-border attacks on you know, Pakistani soil uh, and hot pursuit operations. Um, we would withstood uh, that, that threat um, uh, very ably. Um, uh, all credit goes to Bajwa Doctrine, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, associated to our army chief, uh, General Karam Javed Bajwa. Uh, so with, we withstood that. And now, obviously, after one year, uh, they, have, they have come to this realization that this, there is no military solution. Now, coming to your point, that there are... Um, um, uh, they have all, although they have concluded that they have to withdraw, but again, there is a half-hearted approach in this. Uh, uh, 
uh, they do not want to uh, withdraw fully from Afghanistan because um, if you allow me to in the subsequent arguments, I would tell you that why, what are the U.S. constraints that it does not uh, want to fully um, uh, uh, um, disengage from this region. Um, if, you, if you have read the news uh, this uh, today, um, uh, the, the White House has uh, asked uh, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, uh, to prepare a report about carrying out airstrikes or military operation in Iran. So, so there is always a bigger picture. Um, so uh, they have dawned that they are now they are going to to talk with the Taliban. But Taliban are very shrewd negotiators. Uh, we have seen them in the past. Um, they always, you know, they have their their. Um, uh, priorities uh, cut down and obviously you know um, it's very unfortunate uh, that the, uh, that the Afghan society has been divided into different ethnicities and uh, historically speaking they had been at each other's throat um, and if uh, if uh, there had been a report uh, by one of uh, Afghanistan's uh, government's uh, uh, organization, it had unearthed some unmarked graves, some mass graves had come out uh, of uh, the civil war which took place in 1992. And so, so uh, I'm not very positive, very, very confident about the post uh, 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 U.S. withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan, what would be the situation. Uh, so that is why this is one of the considerations that the United States wants to keep some of the bases in Afghanistan uh, to counter that, that Afghanistan does not spill into a another civil war. Um, uh, Pakistan has played a very, very constructive role in the past, and Pakistan is now leading uh, this is a regional approach. Uh, obviously, if you see Mr. Iran, Adnan, China... I'm sorry, I have to cut you here. Let me move on to you, Ms. Elev. The situation seems to worsen in terms of security forces, uh, seeing more and more uh, death counts, and then also the attacks claimed by the Taliban are also going up. How do you see this unfold in light of the peace talks that are going on? Um, actually, as I said, I said... <clears throat> the peace talk between Taliban and Russia and neighbor countries, they are, uh, it's the first stage. Uh, uh, by the time Afghan government will be involved in this peace talk, um, we will request for ceasefire. And also we would like to request America and also uh, Pakistan and other involved countries in our peace negotiation to first start with ceasefire. Um, right now, we can see that the uh, Taliban are keep uh, keeping attacking us, and they, they still are um, attacking uh, Kabul and also the entire Afghanistan. As you might have heard, last night there was a huge explosion, uh, and uh, we lost uh, civilian uh, lives. Uh, so peace talk like this is not uh, going to be so much successful. If it will be started by announcing ceasefire, then um, uh, we can uh, achieve um, uh, um, some uh, small um, uh, some small things, and then if uh, there won't be any ceasefire, then of course uh, the peace talk is not uh, gonna be succeed uh, like this. Okay, so, so you are basically are... saying this is the first stage, and we can expect this kind of violence. It's not until the Afghan government is also involved that we can expect to see some kind of ceasefire, right? Yeah, so, of course, as you were guest, uh, Mr. Adnan say, uh, this uh, peace negotiation um, has to be led by Afghans, and right. Afghans won't uh, uh, process. Without involving uh, Afghan government, um, of course, uh, other countries cannot decide for us. Even America cannot decide for us. And as we heard from Mr. Khalilzad when he was here, he uh, told us openly that America is not going to withdraw uh, its troops uh, until we, we have not succeeded the first step, uh, especially ceasefire. And uh, by the time we agreed on first step of uh, peace, then um, we will start, start withdrawing a part of our soldiers, not all of them. Because okay. if we let me ask Mr. Dan here, because I see I see two problems merging in this narrative, and this has been discussed ad nauseum and on all across media, but we don't seem to be going anywhere. First of all, Mr. Adnan, there is this one concern that if the U.S. is demanding that they remain in Afghanistan with their military bases, 
Doesn't that mean that their military presence continues, which is exactly what the Taliban is, uh, is against? Exactly. So first of all, uh, just recall uh, the history lessons. Uh, uh, Afghan have always been very, very independent uh, historically. Right. Uh, they have never allowed any foreign troops or foreign uh, forces on their soil. Uh, so this uh, uh, British, uh, the, the Anglo-Afghan wars uh, were unsuccessful. And then we saw in the situation of Soviet Union's invasion in Afghanistan in December 1979. And the same uh, principle applies uh, to the US and NATO led, uh, US led NATO forces in Afghanistan. So there is no future of, uh, of having any foreign boots on the ground in Afghanistan. So this is, first of all, uh, this doesn't uh, uh, go with the, with the ethos of, of Afghan uh, nationalism. Right. Uh, so Taliban, I'm not sure. Maybe they are, they are very pragmatic people. Uh, they may uh, allow some of the troops to stay behind, uh, but again, uh, for their for for having some foothold in in Kabul uh, for their political benefits. Uh, but again, uh, allow me to. Uh, uh, this, this, this. Uh, two, two points I would like to to reflect. Uh, first of all, this uh, uh, Miss Ely has mentioned that this Afghan uh, peace talks have to be done between our Taliban and the Afghan government. So, unfortunately, um, um, I'm very. Uh, it's very unfortunate that the Afghan uh, unity government has been discredited right from the beginning. Uh, successive Afghan governments have okay. uh, have have, have been Adan, seen as illegitimate. I'm sorry. I'll I'll interrupt you. I'm going to come back, come back to that thought. Uh, but quickly, I want to introduce Mr. Uh, Siddiq Sadakat. He is the deputy editor in chief of the Afghanistan Times. He's joining us from Kabul. Welcome to News Five, Mr. Siddiq. We're talking about. Two things here. A, we're talking about the emerging problems in the troop withdrawal because if U.S. demands from the Taliban to remain uh, in Afghanistan with a few military bases, how long and how many boots on the ground does that mean? Secondly, first I'd like you to uh, uh, tell us a little about the situation, a snapshot of what is happening in Afghanistan in light of all the bombings that have taken place in the past 48 hours. Can you describe the scene to us uh, of what is happening in Kabul? Taliban have been refusing to speak directly to that government. So uh, I think what's happening here is, is that um, there's a lot of uh, reaction among the people and the Afghan government is trying its best uh, to control the situation. Uh, but uh, coming to your point of uh, uh, the US military presence uh, gets downsized inside Afghanistan, what will happen? Uh, we believe uh, three Years ago, when the U.S. troops uh, uh, withdrew from Afghanistan, almost 90% of U.S. troops pulled out of Afghanistan. What happened was um, Afghan forces became more powerful and more formidable. So, sorry, I'm going Afghanistan. to interrupt you here. You're saying basically when the troops withdrew, uh, the Afghan forces got stronger. But hold on to that thought. We want to come back and resume this conversation from here right now. You'll have to take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. And we were speaking to our guest, Mr. Siddiq. You were telling us that, in your view, if the, if the foreign forces withdraw from Afghanistan, it gives a very good uh, playing field to the Afghan security forces to strengthen uh, themselves. And they also have a, a, an appeal with the locals. Is that what, is, do you want to continue from that, please? We Afghans believe that uh, only Afghans can uh, restore peace in their country. Other countries, uh, uh, you know, maneuvering to have a, a space in the peace process. But the only peacemaker is the Afghan government. So we are also doing uh, very much uh, that we can do to control the situation have, uh, and make sure that uh, the future talks will be owned and will be directed by uh, the Afghan people and their representatives. But uh, the problem is that uh, the Taliban are not uh, acting to talk to us directly. And that has been very haunting for us. And for direct with the forces. And it, there is a paradox here. The paradox is that uh, they claim that they are fighting uh, 
uh, infidels, as they call, or the American forces, and victims of their ghastly on-call for war is uh, of thousands of civilians over the past decade and a half. Um, and, uh, and they are absolutely okay with talking with the, uh, their enemies, the Americans, and they are refusing to talk to us. And so that, that has made in, it uh, in, very in some ways, for the, the it's government and the people. right. Experts also say, analysts are saying around the world that the reason why we are seeing an escalation of violence by the Taliban in Afghanistan during this time is that they are also trying to prove that they exist, that they have a significant role to play in the peace process. And by initiating talks with anybody but the Afghan government, they're trying to legitimize their stance. How successful do you feel they can be and how long can this go on before we can say that, yes, these peace talks are successful? Well, um, one of the conditions of the Taliban has been uh, the exit of the U.S. from Afghanistan. And uh, eventually, the U.S. Is, is considering exiting from Afghanistan, departing its, its troops. But actually, they have not been doing a very uh, proactive job for the past three, four years. Uh, they have been confined to advisory and counterterrorism mission. And all the fight has been going, has been uh, done by our forces. And uh, Taliban know that in the battlefield, they cannot win this war. But we have another problem. The emergence of uh, more than 20 terrorist groups so if the Taliban join uh, the government, if there is a scenario that the U.S. leaves Afghanistan and the Taliban have uh, eventually accept to uh, come and join the democratic process that's going on in Afghanistan, what will happen is that violence will not be curbed even after the Taliban join uh, the peace process and they get reconciled with us. We have Al-Qaeda, we have Lashkar Taiba, we have 20, uh, maybe, we have ISIS. We have like many dangerous and notorious groups that uh, uh, you know will keep bedeviling the peace in Afghanistan. So, but for now, we have to focus on on, uh, on talking and negotiating with a, with an extremist uh, Taliban group. Very and interesting point, Mr. Siddiq, saying that the uh, Afghan forces and the secure the Afghan forces and the Taliban have one common enemy and those are all the rival militias there and Miss Ile let me ask you this last question from the Afghan Taliban uh, while might have a common enemy they come into conflict in incidents like this which happened on Sunday where they claim that the US and Afghan forces together raided a detention center in northwestern Afghanistan and released 40 Daesh terrorists now, uh, when the Taliban spokesman, Sabiullah Mujahid, gave this statement, he said that both these joint forces joined arms and killed two guards deployed in the prison security, took away these. So it really goes against that very agenda, which is uh, 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 that the U.S. forces also have, uh, which Afghan security forces also have, and the Taliban also have. How do you see this development uh, uh, affecting uh, them uh, coming and joining forces? Yeah, actually, the uh, uh, main um, reason why Afghanistan cannot achieve a proper peace process, um, as uh, our uh, friend Mr. Sedakar said, uh, because several different troops and several, several different uh, terrorist organizations are active in Afghanistan. So why we want to, uh, to involve other countries in peace negotiation? Because we all know how Taliban was created and who did support Taliban and who gave them money. And uh, as we all know, that the process uh, was started by uh, Pakistan, um, Qatar, um, Emirates, and um, uh, Saudi Arabia. These were three countries where, for the first time, they recognized uh, Taliban government um, in Afghanistan. And actually, they were involved. They were a supporter of Taliban. But right now, when we uh, see them getting involved in peace negotiation, it's a good sign for us because people who sub, uh, were supported Taliban a while ago, now they want to uh, mediate the peace talks. It is a, a kind of positive uh, achievement for us. 
And uh, second, what I wanted to say, um, uh, a while ago when Dr. Najibullah was uh, in power, uh, once uh, uh, Russian uh, troops uh, pulled, um, pulled out, uh, within a few months, uh, almost a year, our government was collapsed. Uh, although we had very strong uh, military equipment at, at that time, even jet uh, planes and everything, uh, but it was collapsed. Of course, there was a reason that uh, our own Mujahideen leaders um, uh, sold our uh, military equipment to the neighbor countries. But still, at that time, the government was collapsed. But this time, uh, in 2014, um, NATO troops uh, withdrawn, but still uh, government is, is strong and um, it's, uh, they, they fight the terrorism. And again, uh, let me repeat that part. When Afghanistan war is, is, is a proxy war and other countries are involved in this, so the first step of negotiation belongs to all these countries who were involved in this war. Let me come to you, Adnan, once again, the conversation. Thank you so much, Ms. Ile, for that. And let's move on to you. Mr. Adnan, I want to ask you this question, uh, this, uh, this old rhetoric of it being a proxy war. Uh, I know we've answered this before, but if we are to focus a little on the militant groups that are operating there, that the Taliban is fighting, especially in light of what has just unfolded on Sunday, where U.S. and Afghan security forces raided a Taliban prison and released 40 of these, how do you see this reflecting on the current scenario, especially in, when, we're all try, when they're all trying to come together on the same agenda? Uh, uh, allow me to address the three questions questions uh, which have been raised uh, in the recent comments and uh, uh, I do not want to to hurt the sensibilities of my uh, those participants who are from Afghanistan uh, but let's get some things very straight um, uh, this Taliban is a is 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 part of the Afghan uh, national uh, uh, nationalism, and they had right from the beginning when uh, uh, President Karzai was brought into power and Northern Alliance were given seat in Kabul, uh, they were not accepted. Uh, so there is absolutely no question of uh, recognizing the Afghan government by the by the Taliban and negotiating with them rather in one of my latest articles uh, papers I had I had mentioned that it's going to be a very very brutal uh, civil war kind of a civil, uh, situation um, reminiscent, reminiscent to, uh, to what hap had happened when the Soviets withdrew and in 1992 we had a, a Afghan civil war uh, so there is a lot of talk that Afghanist, that the Taliban should uh, talk to the Afghan government. Um, it's very, very unfortunate, and please excuse me for saying this up front, uh, that uh, uh, there, it's not only Pakistan or in the region, but in the Western countries also, uh, there, is a, there is a very, very strong uh, uh, conviction uh, that the current Afghan government uh, has been discredited. Uh, it's corrupt to boot. Uh, it had been unable uh, to sort out Afghanistan's development and economic issues. Uh, so if you uh, you go back and President Karzai, if you remember, he was, um, uh, uh, sorry to say, that he was uh, labeled as uh, as a mayor of Kabul uh, with not having a, his jurisdiction in the periphery areas. So the same thing applies to the Afghan government. And um, I had I had written in one of my papers in uh, in 2010 uh, that when push comes to shove, uh, all these foreign qualified um, um, uh, uh, officials who are sitting at uh, at plum jobs they will take the first flight out of Afghanistan. And if you see the, the Economist, which is very pre prestigious uh, um, okay. paper, uh, it had uh, written 200,000 had already fled from right. Afghanistan so by 2016. the government is corrupt to the core. You have no confidence in the government, which is also one of the problems, like you said. Let me welcome another guest here who is a defense and political analyst. He's joining us from Islamabad. Welcome to the show, General Wahid Arshad. Um, uh, sorry, uh, yes, I would like to first ask you, um, in light of these developments where the U.S. is demanding from the Taliban that allegedly they want to have still some military bases uh, to remain in Afghanistan and that Afghan soil should not be used as a, base, as a place of uh, planning attacks on the U.S. and other countries, 
But there is this one big concern where the Taliban have categorically demanded complete withdrawal and they're also not talking to the Afghan government. How do you see this paradox? Do you see any way out of it? Well, I think, think I don't think there's any paradox here. I think the, the, the positive thing is that the Taliban and the U.S. have started talking. And I think in time, there will be the discussion and dialogue between all parties who are the stakeholders within Afghanistan. It will just take some more time and more discussion how to go about it. I think ultimately, uh, since the U.S. has not decided to, for a, to go for a political solution, so obviously, the, you know, uh, they don't they don't see a military solution, and if they don't see a military solution, then obviously the the question of uh, bases uh, doesn't arise. So in time, I think the bases will also be wrapped up, and the military will go back. But I think before that, uh, there has to be a political framework in place, which uh, sort of provides political stability and security stability inside Afghanistan. That will take time. The negotiations have started, I think. Uh, which is a positive sign. And let's see where do we go from here. Do you see the, are you confident that the Afghan government and the Afghan security forces, they are in a position of strength that they will be able to handle if and when the U.S. and NATO forces withdraw? You know, uh, what I see is that before NATO and U.S. forces withdraw, there has to be some political arrangement uh, within Afghanistan, uh, maybe in the form of an interim government or something which uh, caters for the interests of all stakeholders. And that will also ensure that there is no sort of uh, drift towards the, uh, the civil war or uh, more violence inside Afghanistan. I think there is room for a lot of maneuver there. There is space available for discussion on that. And I think things will move towards that side. Okay. And uh, Mr. Siddiq, let me come to you. We are talking again about the presence of different militias that the Taliban are fighting, that the U.S. and NATO are fighting. And yet what seems to be lost in translation from incidents like what happened on Sunday is that they're both on the same side. How do you see this unfolding and affecting the peace process? Well, the U.S. Uh, has long wanted to, to have a long-term military presence in Afghanistan. And only the Trump administration is pretty much against uh, keeping all the troops here and asking for uh, confining uh, its uh, future presence in Afghanistan in military bases. So we all know that the U.S. is in Afghanistan because of its own cause. And its own cause could have very much uh, different dimensions. But for Afghanistan, uh, a prolonged military presence uh, could mean a lot. Uh, I cannot be very much precise as to all Afghans want uh, uh, and do I think about the future of the U.S. in Afghanistan. But uh, if uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, came to Afghanistan, it was not uh, uh, open a request of Afghans. And the U.S. is leaving, uh, you know, as Afghans do not want it. So Afghans are not against it. But it, uh, you know, the uh, military presence of Americans could ensure a better uh, ability and capacity of Afghan forces. We need equipment. Uh, we need, uh, uh, you know, more more advice and more training on how to counter terrorism. We have gained a lot of experience over the past four years since we took the leadership, but now we need equipment and we need more support. So uh, if the U.S. confines itself to its uh, military bases, I think the advisory mission that it is doing now will also come to an end. And that is a bad news for us. But that could also serve as a sobering reminder that the U.S. is not very much faithful about its commitment. We have a, a security agreement uh, which was signed between uh, the erstwhile presidents of the both countries, and uh, based on which the U.S. is committed um, uh, to Afghanistan, to military support of Afghanistan. And uh, this will actually be a, a violation of that agreement. Okay, the US leaves and uh, does not continue to support us. Okay, let, let me pull in General Wahid Arshad here. One of the narratives we keep hearing in this conversation is that Pakistan had a detrimental role to play earlier in history. How do you see Pakistan's role evolving, especially in light of how uh, the Trump administration is representing itself, in, in, such as their uh, very 
abrupt withdrawal from Syria and now in Afghanistan they seem to be on a completely different page from NATO uh, coalition forces. I think Pakistan has been playing a, playing a positive role. I think it's a, it's a narrative which doesn't have much, much traction to uh, in Pakistan at least and many other countries and many other stakeholders. I mean, the last many years, Pakistan has been trying its best to to convince everybody that the Afghans need to sit down and decide amongst themselves what they want to do with the country. And we can just support and help and whatever way we can. This is what we are doing. That's why the United States actually now requested Pakistan to to help them in uh, you know coming to a, a conclusive political solution in the country. And this is what we are doing. I mean, the military groups in Afghanistan are not what Pakistan is doing, really. I mean, the Taliban are Afghan, so is the Northern Alliance people, so are other groups. The IS, which is uh, which which emerged and evolved in Afghanistan, is part of the TTP groups, which are uh, in Afghanistan. I mean, Pakistan didn't play any role in emergence of IS in Afghanistan, really. So I think Pakistan has always said that there has to be a political solution, and Taliban are part, part of the political framework in Afghanistan. Somebody likes it or not. So there have to be some arrangement where all stakeholders, you know, have a say in whatever political arrangement is done in Afghanistan, which will ultimately lead to a withdrawal of U.S. and NATO forces. But before that withdrawal, some political arrangement has to take place. And that will necessitate discussion amongst the Taliban, the Afghan government, all stakeholders inside Afghanistan, possibly with support of regional and international players. Do you feel that maybe the Taliban, uh, with the escalation of violence and the attacks that have gone up uh, rapidly in the past weeks, uh, just uh, last week the death toll come to 21 Afghan security forces, do you feel they are trying to uh, solidify their position in the peace talks? My view is that these attacks are not a new thing. The acts of violence will continue to take place. Uh, but what is more important is that if the dialogue continue, continues, I think there will be a reduction of violence when all parties agree to you know, uh, the way it should be done. Uh, the fact on, on ground is that there are few areas, many areas which are under influence and control of Taliban. There are many areas which are under control and influence of so one uh, national army and security forces. So, I mean, unless there is, a, there is a dialogue, discussion, talks, and arrangement where there has to be some reduction in violence, only if all sides agree. So, I mean, dialogue is only answered, only way forward. Okay, thank you so much, General Wahid. Let me welcome another guest, uh, Ms. Amina Khan. She's a senior research fellow who's joining us from Islamabad. We're trying to understand the conflict here, uh, Ms. Amina, uh, in Afghanistan. It is rather complicated. We understand there are many actors, and especially militias who are fighting the Taliban. Taliban are fighting them, as well as the Afghan government, as well as foreign forces. Um, this conundrum is, uh, if you can expand a little on this in trying to translate this, how will they all come to the same page in fighting the same enemy? Um, yeah, well, you see, the thing is that uh, Afghanistan is, is a, very, a very complex case. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, there are so many actors, in fact, so many new actors that have taken center stage. And I think uh, one of the most prominent actors that has taken center stage is uh, the Daesh or the Islamic State of Khuristan province. Um, and I think this is an important element to consider in this entire scenario, because um, for the first time, all regional countries um, have combined their forces and, and, and they're on the same uh, path when it comes to their uh, opposition towards the Daesh. Similarly, if you see uh, the Afghan Taliban, they also do not accept the Daesh in Afghanistan. In fact, the Daesh has caused immense problems for the Afghan Taliban to the point where, you know, they've had defections and they've had to start a recruitment mission to win back defected members. Um, and there have been a number of clashes between these two groups. Um, similarly, you have Kabul that is also struggling to fight with the Daesh. So I think this is one factor that could bring all regional countries, as well as the Afghan Taliban and Kabul, as well as the U.S., which are the three principal stakeholders, to the negotiating table. Because once peace, if at all, is achieved in Afghanistan, you will then have these three combined forces fighting Daesh and hence denying space to the Daesh. Mr. Adan, let me get your comments on this, what Ms. Amna has portrayed here. Do you feel like that strategy is in, a, uh, in alignment to what the U.S. is looking for? 
and will they stick around long enough to carry something like this out if you if you go back to the iraq war uh, during the uh, when this its end was near uh, general petraeus was uh, accused of bribing the sunni tribes in iraq um in mosul and other areas uh, and so that they keep uh, themselves passive and uh, as daesh uh, emerged in iraq uh, uh, they were wearing a uh, us fatigue uh, they had the hummer jeeps and everything and then obviously it took a while to for, uh, for the international community to 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 counter them uh, again then it spilled over into into syria so when we come to afghanistan about talking about the is uh, uh, is is a phenomena which emerged in 2014 and 2015 and if you recall uh, mullah akhtar mansoor the the last uh, um, the, uh, taliban uh, chief he had written a letter at that time he was the deputy uh, commander uh, and uh, second to to mullah omar and he had written a letter to abu bakar al baghdadi in uh, in 2015 asking him to stay away out of afghanistan so taliban are very clear about uh, their position that they are not going to allow any extremist organization any al qaeda type or isis type of organization and now there is a resolve which ms amina was saying if you if you see there had been a very very uh, um, uh, uh, an historic meeting which has took place in 11th of july 2018 okay. in islamabad when all the intelligence chiefs they got together and they had a resolve um uh, iran russia china and pakistan and they had a resolve to eliminate Al- uh, isis from okay. afghanistan and unfortunately this is all the time miss thank you so much mr adnan let me quickly come back to you and thank you so much mr sidiq for your input also and quickly last question with you miss amna khan uh, as we try and wrap up this debate where we're trying to flesh out what are the major uh, roadblocks here with developments coming in the violence going up over there in afghanistan and also the us demanding exactly what the taliban are not ready to give way but there are more state actors pakistan has continuously said uh, that there need to be a conversation going on but how does this conversation bring the taliban the afghan government the us and pakistan and other regional powers to fight what is right now a, a chaotic militia presence in afghanistan Uh, well let me just say a few words on uh, how i th- how i think the the peace process should move forward first of all i think uh, you know the demand that kabul has been consistently meeting of wanting to negotiate with the afghan taliban i think they need to withdraw uh, this demand and hold their horses uh, the afghan ta- uh, taliban have been very clear they have said that they will negotiate with kabul they have not ruled out not speaking to kabul but they first want to negotiate with the us and i think Kabul, if it really does want peace in Afghanistan and it really does want an end to the Daesh, should at least accommodate and appreciate this demand of the Afghan Taliban. Number one. Number two, the only way to move forward in Afghanistan, particularly um, regarding the Daesh, is to bring peace and stability, and that can only be achieved when. peace has been achieved with the afghan taliban through a negotiated settlement uh, and although you know we have seen unprecedented developments during the past year particularly regarding the peace process because again we've never seen um, such remarkable progress regarding the afghan taliban um, uh, and and kabul um, i think it's going to take uh, a lot of patience um and a lot of maturity on both sides because this is a very complex situation so we should not try and you know um create even more spoilers because there are already so many spoilers in the process okay. uh, i think there has to be patience on all sides and i think talks should continue one of the reasons why the recent talks uh in qatar were cancelled was again because of kabul's insistence to be a part of the talks so i think let the talks continue between kabul and the uh, sorry between the taliban and the us and once some sort of an agreement is achieved if at all then later on kabul can be included so the agenda needs to be decided between uh, the of uh, the taliban and the us forces the nato alliance and then expect the government to be pulled in yes that is a optimistic uh, point of view there mr amna something that we have heard throughout the show but unfortunately we can't uh, get into more detail as we uh, run out of time But stay tuned to a news wire. We'll be back tomorrow with a brand new analysis on a brand new story. See you then.